G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Apologies again for the lack of videos last week, but I'm back from holiday now and there's a whole heap of footy to catch up on. So without further ado, let's get into it. So we're currently six rounds into the 2019 season and for me, one of the more interesting talking points is the form of Port Adelaide. They find themselves in the top four and in particular, turn some heads with their win over the Eagles in Perth. Now, I don't think anyone would really argue that the Eagles are a hard team to beat at the moment, but nonetheless, you can't take too much away from Port who were pretty slick and really aggressive and in the wet they were just much hungrier for the contest. For some reason at 30 years old Travis Boak is having the best season of his career but there's also guys like Rockliffe, Wines and Ebert who are all having great seasons. They've always had a talented nucleus in my opinion but now they've got some exciting youngsters as well who can really complement that talent. We may be seeing a similar effect to last year with the Eagles who shed a bunch of players, brought in a lot of youngsters in the team and actually improved. So last year Port were in the top four around about halfway through the season and they fell away pretty badly so the question will be again can they sustain it for the whole season? Nonetheless, they are absolutely one of the form sides of the competition and a smoky for the top four, absolutely. Now, following what was a pretty average Derby 49, the Dockers hit back with two impressive wins in a row, particularly their win in Canberra over the GWS Giants. Now, we know Fremantle went on a big recruiting drive last year to get some forward talent, but what's evident so far is that their best forwards this year were already on the list last year, Matt Taberner and Brandon Matera. Tabs has always been a bit of a malign player at Fremantle, but it's easy to forget he's just turned 25 and it seems like he's really starting to hit his straps now. He probably still needs to improve his goal kicking a little bit, but I'd have to say he's got to be a pleasant surprise for the Fremantle fans so far. Especially Busher, who I'm pretty sure used to call him Matt Turdener. We also have to acknowledge David Mundy for 300 awesome games. He was brilliant against the Dogs, probably my best on ground, and he shows absolutely no signs of slowing down. At this rate, I reckon he could play for another three seasons. Now, I've mentioned this guy before, but he keeps raising the bar on his performances, and that's Jay Gromira. He's a player who's really stood up in the absence of Tom Mitchell. In Obviously. fact, in my opinion, I think Jago O'Meara is on the verge of becoming a better player than Tom Mitchell. Now, we know that Mitchell is a prodigious ball winner. He wins the ball on the inside and he links up on the outside. But for mine, he doesn't have the same impact as guys like O'Meara. I'm not saying he's there yet, but it's getting pretty bloody close. O'Meara was our true footy player of the round last week. He had 42 possessions, 24 of them were contested. He had nine clearances and he kicked a goal. In fact, he had the ball 15 more times than the next best man on ground. The one thing holding O'Meara back this year is his disposal efficiency. In fact, he's going at just 63% this year. He's also ranked first in the league for clangers and second in the league for turnovers. Now, it doesn't mean everything. Buddy Franklin led the league in clangers the year he won the Coleman medal and kicked 100 goals. That being said, for a midfielder, he probably needs to tidy that up. Nonetheless, if he can, I think he's a smoky for an All-Australian season. Speaking of young gun midfielders taking their game to the next level, an interesting question for me is, has Lockie Neal improved on last year or has he always been this good and never received the credit? I thought this would be interesting to look into, so I had a look at the stats. So far, he's averaging four more possessions a game and three of them being contested. He's also made slight improvements in his clearances per game as well as his meters gained. The more significant one for me is probably his efficiency has gone up from 73% to 80%. 80% disposal efficiency for a midfielder is pretty darn elite. When he was at Fremantle, I thought the one thing he didn't have was damaging ball use, but I think that's improved now. He was always a pretty good player at Fremantle, but he was always in the shadow of Nat Five, And he also played in a team that struggled for the last three years. Personally, I always respected him as a workmanlike midfielder, but never thought of him as a match winner. And to be fair, I definitely wasn't on my own there. But to answer the question, he was already a good player, but I think he has slightly improved. It does seem he's a Monty for his first All-Australian jumper this year. Now, it's been well documented this week that Connor Rosie has absolutely joined the two horse race for the Rising Star alongside Sam Walsh. A few weeks ago, Rosie kicked five goals to win the nomination against Brisbane and he backed it up with a really good performance against the Eagles. I know he was a high pick, but he's actually exceeded my expectations so far. I think sometimes medium forwards can struggle when they come into the competition just because it's easy to get lost in that position. It was also the fact that Port were a bit of an unknown this year. But so far in six games, he's been pretty consistent and got a lot of people talking him up. One thing I will say though, is that I reckon Kane Corns has made a bit of a shit call for the first time ever. I'm gonna read you a quote of him describing Connor Rosie. Bear with me for a second here. Go back and look at Nathan Fife. When he first entered the competition, he was a skinny, wiry player who played across half forward mainly before eventually He's got three seasons in the gym, and then we see the specimen of a man we see now. I think Rosie should be modeling his game on Nat Fife, but Rosie is a better kick than Fife. So what I'm saying is, Port fans, you might have the next Nathan Fife on your hands. Wait, what? How do we get from one to the other there? Literally, the only thing that Fife and Rosie have in common is that they're skinny half forwards. Stylistically, Rosie and Fife at the same age were not actually that similar. Does that mean that Will Hayward is also the next Nat Fife or Oscar Allen? Now, Connor Rosie is a really prodigious talent, but he doesn't really play like Fife at all. To be fair, 
He's more dangerous around goals and he's quicker and a better kick. What makes Fife amazing, other than his aerial ability, is his prodigious talent on the inside. There's absolutely nothing to suggest so far that Rosie can play on the inside as well. It's also not as simple as spending three seasons in the gym. Nat Fife is a genetic freak. If it was as simple as Rosie spending three years in the gym, you'd see a lot more half forwards spending three years in the gym and then trying to make it as an inside midfielder. I wanna make it clear, I'm not putting Rosie down at all. I just think it's a ridiculous call from Kane who's clearly a massive Port Adelaide fan. Other than the fact that Fife was a half forward when he was drafted, I do not see the similarity at all. Moving on to North Melbourne, and they currently sit at one and five on the ladder. Honestly, it's hard to see them climbing out of the bottom four this year. Naturally, we know they topped up last off season going from established talent. And this of course has invited a lot of criticism because they're clearly well short of finals contention. Some of that criticism is based around the idea that North should have properly bottomed out rather than try and rebuild on the fly like the Hawks. Personally, I don't buy that and I still fully support the approach that North has taken here. They've identified, like some of the other bigger clubs around the league, that lengthy rebuilds are risky and time consuming. There's absolutely no guarantee that with better draft picks, you're actually gonna draft better players. It's all about talent identification and a bit of luck too. Development's also really important in that. So if a team's getting belted every week, it's gonna be harder to develop your youth, in my opinion. There's also the financial considerations. North are a smaller club, so bottoming out for five years for them might have a serious impact on how many people show up to their games. I don't know if a smaller club like North could get away with a proper five year rebuild. And further to that, it's not as though North have actually sold the farm to get in the established players they got. Last year, due to academy picks, they still took Karen Thomas in the first round. They got Bailey Scott. LDU was picked for a couple years ago and Jai Simpkin was a first rounder the year before that. Overall, I like their balanced approach and I know things are going horribly badly at the moment, but I think when their experienced guys like Zeebel and Cunnington and Higgins start to move on, they'll be grateful they got someone like Jared Polak or Aaron Hall. Now we may be witnessing another Another significant fall from grace this year, it appears the Eagles are plummeting further away from top four calculations week after week. Now it is early days, but aside from two great performances against the Giants and the Pies, the Eagles have had probably four stunningly bad performances this year. Their out and out stars that they usually rely on like Kennedy and Darling look absolutely physically cooked or underdone or something. But it's more than that, across the whole ground they're getting mauled in the contested stuff. I think the term premiership hangover is pretty overused. In fact, it's becoming a borderline buzzword. I think the use of it is a little bit ignorant of the fact that it's actually really hard to stay at the top year after year. It's not as simple as, oh, the players won last year so they might not necessarily want it as much this year. It's certainly a factor, but, but this is a cutthroat industry and a very even competition. It only takes being 5% off to fall back to the rest of the pack. So I'm not going to use the term hangover to describe the Eagles, but make no mistake, they are playing for a spot in the finals this year, not top four. It's still early days, but they probably need to win 12 of their last 16 to make the top four, which seems a bit of a bridge too far. The Eagles sit at three and three with real 50-50 games, in my opinion, against Gold Coast and St Kilda coming up. If they lose either of those, they've probably let this season slip. Now it's time to take you through our True Footy Player of the Year award. The man I talked about before, Jago Amira, was our player of the round, scoring 18 votes out of a possible 20. However, However, it wasn't enough to crack the top five of our rankings. Adam Trelaw still sits comfortably in top spot, while Cornelio slips into second spot on the back of four goals against the Swans. Travis Boat continues his excellent form to crack our top five for the first time this season. Now for our Phantom Brownlow Medal Award. Following a dominant performance against the Eagles, Dangerfield has moved equal top of our Phantom Brownlow medal count after six rounds. It really does appear we have a new generation of young midfielders emerging as the elite players of the competition. All of Billings, Neil, O'Meara and Cornelio sit on 10 votes or more and all of them are 25 or under. Now, in our AFL Fantasy True Footy competition, we do have a new league leader. His name is Chad Booth and his team's name is Doodle Bob. Poor Bob. Chad is averaging an impressive 2,173 points a game this year, but it's tied at the top and he's only 17 points ahead of the next best. Well done, Chad. We also had our best round of footy tipping this year. In fact, no one scored less than seven this round. We did have one person tip a perfect nine this week, and that's my friend Brendan Courtney, AKA Big Booty Bitches. Still running with that name, eh? It's funny that this is the second time he's won the round this year and he still sits in eighth spot. I think he scored a stinky two one round, so that's probably why. Nonetheless, I have retained my spot at the top of the ladder with 34 tips correct so far this year. There will be no dancing in this episode, but I am pretty happy with that. All right, guys, thanks once again for watching this episode of True Footy Reacts. It has been great to be back with you talking footy once again. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. My weekly tips video will be 
be out in just a day or two or whenever I get it up, hopefully Wednesday. As I said in the past, if you use Facebook, you should get around the True Footy page because we're doing a little bit more stuff on that day to day. Let me know what you thought of the video in the comments and I will see you very soon, guys. Thanks.